In order to have a respectable understanding of the Vietnam War, we have to rewind all the way back to the late 1800s when France was colonizing Southeast Asia. And in particular, it colonized what is now Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And they were collectively called French Indochina. You can see Cambodia here, Vietnam along the coast, and then Laos right over here. And France stayed the colonizing power. I have a little gap in my timeline here. And they stayed a colonizing power all the way through all the way through World War all the way through World War II. And so you can imagine during World War II, France was quickly overrun by the Germans. The Vietnamese wanted their independence. And so you have a, a liberation movement that rises up, and it was led by the Viet Minh. And the Viet Minh were led by Ho Chi Minh. And this right here is a picture. This right here is a picture of Ho Chi Minh. And besides being a liberation movement, they were also communist. They were also communists, which you could imagine later on during the Cold War will kind of uh, bias the United States against them. But you fast forward through World War II, eventually the Japanese take control over Indochina, over Vietnam. And, but by the time 45 rolls about, or at least the end of 45, and we know that the United States defeats Japan, now all of a sudden the Viet Minh are able to declare a somewhat temporary independence. And it's temporary because shortly after that, and the region is occupied temporarily by the Chinese in the north and, and the British in the south, who were part of the Allied forces against the Axis. But eventually, you have the French coming back, and they want to reassert their their control over their former colony. And you have this war that develops, the first Indochina War between the French and the people sympathetic to the French, the, the Vietnamese who are loyal to the French, and the North. And the French, and just to make it clear how it sets up, when, when at the end of World War II, when you had the temporary occupiers, the British and the Chinese, the Chinese obviously had more influence in the North. The British had more influence in the South. When the French come back, they essentially are able to reinstate control over the South. So right when this, the, the Indochina War is beginning, the French already have more control over the South. And actually, historically, the French had more influence in the South as well. During French colonial rule, it was really the southern third of Vietnam where you had a lot of French influence. And this is a current map, and the current map does not have this orange boundary over here that we'll talk about in a second. It's all Vietnam is now unified. But before the Vietnam War, this was not Ho Chi Minh City. This was, this was Saigon. And Saigon was kind of where uh, most of the French control was centered. But you fast forward to 1954. This ends up in a bit of a stalemate. And so you have the Geneva Conference of 1954 that partitions Vietnam along the 17th parallel between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And the whole point of this partition was really to just allow for a cooling off period, a period where you can have things settling down and then having elections. It wasn't meant to be a permanent partition. But there was a 300-day period where people could move across the partition. And during that partition, you actually had 900,000 people, mainly Catholics, move from the north to south. You also had several hundred thousand people moving from the south to the north. So it wasn't a one-way movement. But net-net, most of the movement by Roman Catholic Vietnamese was from the north to the south. You fast forward a little bit, you eventually have, uh, uh, and, and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation here, no Din Diem take control. He starts off as prime minister in 54. Eventually, he takes control, becomes president in 55. This is him right here. He takes control of South Vietnam. And this guy is not a big fan of things like elections or, or non-corrupt government and, and all of the rest. And he takes control of South Vietnam. But you can imagine that the United States is positively inclined to him. One, he, he, you know, he dresses in nice Western suits and all of that, and nicely combed hair. But he was also anti-communist. And at this time, period, the United States is starting to think in terms of uh, Cold War, in, in terms of how do we stop communism, how do we contain it, this whole theory of containment that the best way to stop uh, the Soviet Union is to just make sure that communism can not spread, that it gets contained, that we have the domino theory in the United States, that if one country falls to communism in a region, that the rest of the countries will eventually fall, and that is not good for containment. So we did not want South Vietnam to fall. We essentially start supporting these characters over here. And even from the early 50s, the United States starts supporting the anti-communists. And at first, this support, it's in the, I guess we should say, the guise of advisors. 
But these advisors, one, we start sending more and more aid, more and more advisors. And these advisors start getting more and more involved in the actual conflict. And so after this partition, you can imagine that you still have an ongoing conflict between the North and the South. And on top of that, you have actors who are sympathetic to the North, sympathetic to the Viet Minh, sympathetic to Ho Chi Minh in the South. Some of them were in the North. They come back to the South. Some of them were just in the South. And they did not like the Diem government. Besides just being sympathetic to Ho Chi Minh, Diem was a fairly corrupt um, uh, autocrat autocratic ruler who wasn't a big fan of democracy. And so these, these players in the South who started to rise up against against President Diem or the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong. And so this is really sets up what the Vietnam War is all about. You have the communist uh, uh, Ho Chi Minh controlled North that was fighting a conventional war against the, the South. You have this you have this partition on the 17th parallel. And on top of that, you have an unconventional fighting force, I guess you could call them guerrillas, in the, in the south of Vietnam called the Viet Cong. So it was kind of a, a double, uh, there, there are two things that the south had to fight against, the north officially and also this, this insurrection that was occurring within the south. And so the whole time, the United States did not want this insurrection to succeed. They did not want all of Vietnam to become communist. We keep sending more and more advisors. It actually started even before. For Kennedy, but in Kennedy, he starts sending. Uh, he, he escalates the number of advisors that get sent. It's still not at this point. It's still not a formal war. We haven't officially declared war. We don't have officially soldiers in battle. You fast forward to 1963, besides all of uh, the, the, the great characteristics of DM that I already mentioned, he also was into persecuting Buddhists. So uh, to make matters worse, so you know, not only was he corrupt, not only did he not like elections, but he liked persecuting his own people. And by, 60, by 1963, this kind of got out of hand. Uh, he, he, his, his level of persecution of the Buddhists, he started t storming temples and all the rest. And so he was assassinated. And not only was he assa he's assassinated, it kind of leaves this power vacuum. We have all of these people uh, uh, jockeying for control. None of these really especially savory characters inside the South. These two guys eventually come to power, Win Cao Kai and Win Van Tu. Wait a few years, Win Van Tu is able to get this guy out of the picture. And then by 1967, I don't have it over here, 1967, you have Tu is, has now uh, taken control. But during that period, or actually before Kai and Tu take power, in 1964, you have one of the shadiest incidents in American history. As you can imagine, we, as in our function as an advisors, we had sent ships into the Gulf of Tonkin, right af off of the coast of North Vietnam. And so the original story goes, and this is a very suspect original story, in 1964, the US Maddox, and this is the original story, claimed that it was attacked, or it was claimed that the US Maddox was attacked by uh, North North. Uh, Vietnamese patrol boats, and that there was some, you know, there was a little bit of a skirmish, there was an exchange of fire. And it was also claimed that a few days later, another boat in the Gulf of Tonkin, another US vessel, was attacked by a North Vietnamese boat. That was the original story. This angered Congress, this angered the American people, you know, how dare they attack ships that are sitting off of the coast, uh, warships that are sitting off the coast. And so this kind of gave this kind of gave the the emotional the emotional uh, a fuel to pass the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. So these incidents or these purported incidents, this kind of attack on the USS Maddox and this other thing that might have happened, these were called the Gulf of Tonkin incidents. This angered Congress, angered the American people. So we passed the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. And what's relevant about it is that it gave LBJ here. It gave him the authority to officially engage in a war in Vietnam, to officially escalate it to an actual war that the US was involved in. And this whole time, I've been saying it's shady, because it's now been shown that, one, the Gulf of Tonkin, well, it's not clear that really anything happened. There might have been some firing from the USS Maddox. It, they might, they, it, they might have actually engaged the North, uh, the North Vietnamese patrol boats. The other possibility that might have happened is that they 
that nothing happened. So, but either way, you, you, uh, any way you look at it, it's now been fairly established that it was not a uh, a real incident. It was not really North Vietnam attacking attacking the United States. But it was val- it was it was relevant because it really escalated the war. So now you have Johnson. And did I say North Korea originally? I'm, I apologize for that. We're talking about North Vietnam. I, I don't remember what my brain actually said. Of course, North Vietnam. But it gave it gave Johnson. The, uh, the 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 power to escalate the war and so his administration is really the heart of the Vietnam War when the war was really escalated we eventually get to 500,000 US troops but the whole time this is happening you can imagine that Johnson and the military leaders in Viet and the American military leaders in Vietnam are telling the American people oh we're fighting communism we're about to win this is a noble war and you fast forward and you know especially the a part about to win, you fast forward to 1968, and all of a sudden you have the Viet Cong, who the American leaders have told the American people in the Congress that are they're about to be defeated. And then in 1968, the Viet Cong orchestrate the Tet Offensive, which is this, this massive uh, coordinated attack on a bunch of targets throughout, 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 South Vietnam. And so even though it was, wasn't completely successful militarily, the intent of the Tet Offensive was to kind of completely turn the tides in the war. It made the American people in Congress rightfully suspicious. You, you know, Mr. Johnson, you had told us you had told us that we were about to win the war and we were about to, you know, the Viet Cong were all almost defeated and all of a sudden they orchestrate this this sophisticated attack on us. It rightfully made the American public suspicious. On top of that, and you know this, this probably made matters a lot worse. The My Lai massacre comes out, and in every war there are massacres, but the United States at least believes that its 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 soldiers can kind of take the high road. That it's it's it, they don't engage in 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 these type of things. But the My Lai massacre showed that really no soldiers are immune to massacres, and this is really a disgusting massacre, and it was documented, and if you really want to be disturbed, do a Google search for images of the My Lai Massacre. It will ruin your weekend. It, it, it'll depress you. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's US soldiers killing a village of, of, of innocent uh, women and children. Uh, there's pictures of dead babies. It's horrible, and on, on top of, uh, to make matters worse, or even you know, add insult to injury, the soldiers who committed it, there was actually a few who tried to defend the the villagers, and they they were <laughs> when they came back they were they 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 were treated almost like traitors. But the soldiers who actually uh, did the attack, only one of them got jail time, and it was only a couple of years of jail time. And this is for massacring a village of of of, of women and children. So already you had the Tet Offensive makes the American public s- suspicious of whether we can even win this war, and then you have the My Lai Massacre, which just disgusts the public, and 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 makes people realize that we're involved in a war that not even clear who are the good guys anymore, not even clear what the real goals are. Make matters worse, you fast forward to 1971, the Pentagon Papers get leaked to the New York Times, and these pretty much articulate, it's a classified document that articulates that the leadership, the military and non-military leadership of the Vietnam War was to some degree lying to Congress and the American people. It was lying about how the war was going. It was lying about what activities it was doing. It did not tell the American people in Congress that it was actually engaged in war in Laos and Cambodia. And a lot of the reason why we were engaged in Laos and Cambodia is because that's where the supply routes were between the North and the South. They ran through Laos and Cambodia. And the most famous of them, and you might have heard of it, is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And it wasn't just one trail, it was actually a network of trails. And so a lot of the activity that was going on in Laos and Cambodia was kind of carpet bombing of what the the U.S. thought were some of these supply routes. And it, we never really got a good, you know, we never, well, that's a whole other debate. But the, it wasn't just one trail that was easily bombed. It was all of these little footpaths and all of these other things where arms were able to be transported from the north to the south. But the Pentagon May papers rightfully made the American people even more suspicious. And then now we're entering into Nixon's administration, and he was still doing the carpet bombing, you know, still atrocities going on. But he, his whole goal was to kind of wind down the war, bring the troops out on a timetable without kind of a an official defeat. So you fast forward to 1973, you have the Paris Peace Accords, where officially there is peace between uh, the 
the North, the South, the North, and the Americans. You can imagine it from the North's point of view. They're like, sure, we'll sign some peace accords. It'll just make the Americans go away. Once the Americans go away, they won't be able to come back since this was such a hugely unpopular war. It was, uh, it was such a, it was such a, a waste of, of uh, for America on, on so many dimensions, especially America's prestige as a global actor. We'll just wait for them to leave, and then we can overrun the South after that. And that's essentially what happens. In 1975, the North just overruns the South, and then, in, in, and then later that year, you have, you have Saigon falling to the North, and then it becomes Ho Chi Minh City. And just this whole period, you have President Tu is in power. And just to show where his priorities are, right near the end, right when the North is falling to uh, South Vietnam, and you can kind of see the writing on the wall, he gives a speech to the Vietnamese people saying that he'll never desert them. But then when he, when he really makes it, when it ma becomes pretty clear that, that Saigon is going to fall to the North Vietnamese, he gets on a big, on a big uh, US transport plane with literally 15 tons of luggage. 15 tons of luggage. I'll let you think about how much luggage that is. And $15 million, $15 million worth of gold. And this is $15 million worth of gold in 1975. So you can imagine how much he really cared about, about the Vietnamese people. And he eventually ends up settling in Massachusetts. And he died there in, in uh, about, about 10 years ago. So you can imagine this was a an ugly incident for the world, an ugly, super ugly incident for the Vietnamese people, a, 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 a super ugly chapter in American history. It was the first war that won America lost, but more, it, it hurts prestige, it, it, it hurts uh, America's ability to uh, influence what was going on in other parts of the world. You know, you had the containment theory that, you know, we had to stop communism from spreading and the domino theory that if if one country would fail to com fall to communism then the other one were that didn't happen. The South did fall, but we didn't have the rest of Southeast Asia falling to communism. So it kind of disproved the the domino theory, especially because after the Vietnam War the, the United States would not be able to enter another war like it for some time because the American people wouldn't let it happen. So so to some degree, it would have been easier for communism to spread because people would have known that the U.S. couldn't engage it. But despite that, the domino theory didn't happen. But it was just all around ugly. I mean, the, just the, the besides the massacres and the raping and the pillaging of, of innocents that happened on really on all sides of, of this, you have one to three million Vietnamese. Vietnamese, and no one will really know the actual count, but that's a huge number. One to three million Vietnamese were killed. You have 58,000. 58,000 American troops being killed, American troops. And you have hundreds of thousands of Cambodians and Laotians who were never really in, formally involved in the war. They were, they were killed, especially due to a lot of this carpet bombing uh, campaign. So these are, these, are, these are, I mean, just atrocious numbers and, and uh, really one of the worst and ugliest chapters in, in, in US history.